Uh, and my, my very first one is uh, Nicholas Copernicus's uh, The Revolution of Heavenly Spheres. Uh, and this is the preface. Uh, it's addressed to Pope Paul III. He says, For a long time, then, I reflected on this confusion of the astronomical traditions concerning the derivation of the motion of the universe's spheres. I began to be annoyed at the movements of the world's machine uh, created for our sake by the best and most systematic artists in the ball, but not understood with greater certainty by the philosophers. They talked about the, the Ptolemaic system, uh, and it has. It's not perfect in predicting uh, when astronomical events will happen. And his approach to this problem is something that we want to emulate. Uh, for this reason, I undertook the task of reading the works of all the philosophers which I could obtain to learn whether anyone had ever pro proposed other notions of the universe's spheres than those expanded by the teachers of the schools. So here's an example of, from the sources. Uh, and for this talk, uh, I'm just going to call everybody scientists. That's kind of a 19th century term. I'm just going to go backwards. Probably everybody, which, probably every person I'm quoting here will probably consider themselves.
I actually completely agree with the Ptolemaic system. He, he's, he states where he agrees with the Ptolemaic system, which Ptolemaic system, Earth unmovable in the center of the universe, everything goes around. Uh, and this is very similar to, say, our Augsburg Confession, where the, the first two articles are not controversial at all. It helps to start building some uh, agreement with your audience. All right, the universe is spherical. Uh, the Earth, too, is spherical. This got complete agreement with Ptolemy also. He even strengthens this argument uh, but describing how the, the Earth forms a sphere with water, how water flows to the deck as far as it forms a sphere. Um, and then this is also in complete agreement with Ptolemy. The motion of the heavenly bodies is uniform, eternal, and circular, or compounded of circular motions. Uh, now, uh, in the Ptolemaic system, we have everything going around the Earth, and uh, this compounded circular motion is what we call epicycles. Uh, and maybe the best way to think of it, imagine, imagine how the moon moves around the sun. It goes in a circle around the Earth, so they assume that you know the planets are traveling in a circle, and then the circle on top of the circle. Uh, and he actually doesn't. Uh, disagree with that the cycles. It doesn't go away until uh, Kepler uh, describes motions of as as ellipses. But um, but he says, you know the heavenly bodies? They do move in circular patterns uh, in in a uniform eternal way. But how about the Earth? Can the Earth since all the other bodies do that, can the Earth do it? And if so, what is the position of it? Well, obviously, he's going to argue that it goes around the sun, a circle around the sun. Uh, this next point is really important because the ancients had a really good reason uh, for believing that the Earth didn't move. The stars from one season to the other don't really change. If we are moving as much as they say we are, uh, if if the Earth is moving a lot, the stars should look a little bit different, say, from summer to winter. Uh, and uh, that's called a stellar par parallax. Um, it's, not, and it's so small because they're so far away. Uh, so he says the stars don't change because they are very far away. And he, it actually ends up being that he underestimated how far away they were. Uh, and here's a very important point. Yes. Ah, you got five. Okay. Right. Big sun, but where are you Um. All right. Uh, so this is a very important part about making your argument. Being able to restate your opponent's arguments. Says why the ancients thought that the Earth remained in the center. He goes through all their arguments, and then the next step is refuting them. Uh, and he talks about the inadequacies of their previous arguments. I, I really like that. Um, one of the things he says is that the Earth, uh, the Earth mo one of the objections is the, the violent motion of the Earth. Uh, if the Earth is moving, it must be moving pretty fast, and one can feel it. And his argument is, well, how fast must the heavens be moving? It, if, it, if they go over, how much worse would it be on the heavens going all the way around the Earth in one day? Uh, how far away they are. All right. Uh, can several motions be attributed to the Earth, uh, the center of the Earth, uh, center of the universe? Uh, and this is talking about the daily motion of the Earth. That's one motion. Uh, there's the yearly motion of the Earth around the sun. They actually consider it a third based on the uh, tilt of the Earth. That's very similar to the one going around the sun. Uh, and then he goes to the, uh, the heavenly spheres, which we'd recognize today with the sun in the middle, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, the moon going around it, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the, the uh, fixed stars. And immovable, uh, actually fixed, unlike they were uh, in the Ptolemaic model. 
Uh, why else should we read scientists here? Scientists are sometimes artists and poets also. I kind of saw some of the Galileo poetry. You'll, you'll see, uh, and if you continue reading in that, you'll see Kepler's too. Uh, but they're also artists uh, because a lot of times they're seeing things that uh, nobody's seen before. We have the explorers who are going to new places that uh, with new plants and animals that haven't been seen before. So this is a, an illustration. This is by uh, Sydney Parker. He is on board the HMS Endeavour. This is Captain Cook's journey around uh, journey around the world. Uh, they stop in Tahiti to watch the eclipse, and this is one of their staple foods there. Uh, and this is great uh, a great exercise for students uh, to to look at these sort of things and then try to emulate them because to to have the eye of the artist where you actually have to see how things are put together in every little part uh, is a great skill for scientists to have. Uh, other ones, another uh, field that opens up is the field of optics. The microscope is developed uh, and the telescope is developed and you're seeing, people are seeing things that haven't been seen before uh, and communicate them via drawings. And this, this this book contains drawings and nice little write-ups on them too. Uh, and it, it's a great exercise to maybe see a selection of this and then uh, maybe use that microscope magnification. Go look at it coming up and try to draw it, try to communicate it to somebody who doesn't, hasn't seen it under the microscope. Uh, scientists read other scientists' work. Uh, we've seen this with Copernicus already. We went back and read the philosophers. Uh, about every scientific paper that you read is going to start out with talking about the previous work done in the field, and, and then going from there, building upon it. Uh, the example I want to give here is kind of a, a really great example of it. This is Sir Humphrey Davy, a famous English chemist. Uh, he, his book, Elements of Chemical Philosophy, uh, is kind of written as a chemistry textbook for his day. And his introduction uh, is just the history of chemistry going from the ancients up to his day. <laughs> <laughs> and he's read all these people. Uh, and you can tell he's read all the people. And I'm, I'll, I'll, I have to give you such a brief overview is that but you know he starts with Aristotle uh, he is the great founder uh, but he's not that impressed with this Aristotelian chemistry you know <laughs> four elements maybe five or there when fire and earth and then you uh, but and he says maybe the maybe the problem is he attempted too many subjects to get to correct on everything <laughs> uh, Roman science well Repackaging the Greek science. <laughs> um, then we enter another uh, era in chemistry, and that's the Arabic uh, era in chemistry, alchemy. Uh, uh, Kieber is the most famous of uh, the alchemists, uh, the Arab alchemists. Uh, he does make lots of important chemical discoveries, and then he's also, you know, uh, trying to find the philosopher's stone, trying to let him build, that sort of thing. Uh, and I, you know, sometimes we think of chemistry as, you know, we think of solution, our picture of chemistry is like solution chemistry, mixing things together. <laughs> but metal chemistry is, is with the furnace, the forge, smelting, and mixing out molten things together. Uh, and he says, well, it, it, it's glad that they had a good motivation to, to do this, you know, <laughs> tedious and disgusting processes in the first purchase. <laughs> so so their, pro, uh, their, their motivation to find flat out of gold, uh, to find the elixir of life, uh, it's good motivation for them to do the really tough work of uh, metal chemistry. <laughs> uh, you know, after Arab chemistry, excuse me, after, after Arab alchemy comes the era of European alchemy. Uh, and it's actually really interesting. I can't put much of that in, in here, but he actually picks up, like, these guys are worthless. They, they, uh, <laughs> you know, nothing too, 
nothing to either instruct or amuse a person of intellect. So you think the optimist would at least be interesting, but a lot of them he says no. He picks out some high points and people that made made some good contributions up in this era. Uh, and he actually mar marks the death of the last alchemist in 1616. Uh, you know, the people that killed alchemy, Gilbert descending Kepler, and Libavius being the last alchemist, at least according to him, who died in 1616. Uh, and uh, he, he quotes Lord Bacon here, but uh, describes the alchemists as farmers who are looking at, in their field for a treasure. And by digging up, digging all around, actually make the soil fertile for, for, uh, <laughs> uh, so the alchemists left fertile soil for the, the field of chemistry to, to grow up out of. Um, and he goes on talking about scientists up to his day. He complains that Newton makes such, has some good chemical ideas, but makes such great discoveries in astronomy and, and physics that sends all the people in that direction and away from chemistry, which is his favorite. <laughs> um, there we go. All right, next one, why primary citizens in science? Uh, because scientists write about their experiments. Um, instead of probably more useful to us than just learning our eight steps of whatever to find the problem. I think to actually read how an actual experimentalist performs their experiment, designs their experiment, uh, it, it's going to be really valuable to us. Uh, and scientists repeat other scientists' experiments. So uh, the examples I have here, uh, Gregor Mendel, uh, experiments in plant hybridization, has a famous experiments on heredity using pea plants. Uh, and this is such an involved experiment that's going to go for such a very long time uh, that you have to be, do it carefully. Uh, I have this, this quote here, the value and utility of any experiment are determined by the fitness of the material to the purpose for which it is used. And thus in the case before us, it cannot be in material what plants are subjected to experiment and in what manner such experiment is conducted. So he doesn't choose, just choose pea plants because he like, likes them. Uh, he, he picks them because they have a relatively short lifespan. He actually says, talked about people who did heredity experiments on willow trees. <laughs> uh, which, you know, uh, it's going to be a lot slower going. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the pea plants are able to really control pollinization. He can, you know, remove the stamen and, and, and do some things that, that are, uh, that really allow him to control pollinization. Uh, and, you know, he has to do this over several generations, so he's very careful about how he designs this experiment uh, and conducts it. Uh, this is actually a pretty short work. It's maybe 40 pages altogether, uh, and not, not, not too hard. Uh, I mean, the math is only probabilities, so it's a really useful uh, thing to read. Um, another kind of example of experiments, uh, a lot of experiments, uh, this is from Sir Isaac Newton's Optics. Uh, this is a book where he uh, describes the, how white light is made out of many colors, how the spectrum exists, uh, and that they are all present in white light and not just some trick of the, the prism. Uh, and he does a series of experiments. So these are the drawings, and they're accompanied by detailed instructions on how he, how he did it and how he uh, uh, and, the, and his observations. So this is just the hole in the wall prism, uh, and then observing the spectrum. Color illustrations would be nice, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then he tries a few other things. So kind of a series of experiments right here. So we got one prism. We got another prism 90 degrees, we get the same thing, just slightly, it, but uh, it goes on. He sort of filters it down to get a single color. And you see that we've got this prism, we've got sort of a barrier that's going to let some of the light through, uh, and then another barrier that lets some of the light through. And, uh, and you know, we, we got experiments involving reflection and refraction, so it hits the surface. Some part of it's reflected, part of it's refracted, uh, and you know, 
this is, and there's lots of works like this. You don't have to choose optics if that's not a good thing. But, but if a person were to just uh, go through these and repeat these experiments, they're going to learn a lot, build the skills to conduct a proper experiment, and then after this, you might think, well, what if I tried this? You, um, so when we do experiments, uh, we don't need to kind of pretend like we're the first thing, first person to do experiments. Sometimes we're like, and what's going to happen? Well, a lot of times the answer is if we read ahead a little bit, we'd know. <laughs> uh, uh, but but if, if you're actually just repeating some of these experiments, uh, you're building some skills of both, you know, building apparatuses, uh, doing things carefully, uh, and making observations. And then, after you've done that a little bit, then then you're going to be in the position where where you'd be able to design some of your own experiments. All right, scientists describe their scientific philosophy. Uh, they, they, and it's not like there's one philosophy when it comes to scientists. So the lots of scientists have their own, and you know, and. They use them differently. Some some are experimentalists, and, and uh, now some are making great theories. And there's not just one approach to science. So it's actually kind of good to read lots of them. Uh, I have a few examples here. Um, this is Sir Humphrey Davy. Same book as before. Same introduction. So it, uh, you know, if you read, I don't you don't need to read the whole book, but if you read the introduction to this book, it's really great. Um, so he says, the object of chemical philosophy is to ascertain the causes of all phenomena of this kind and to discover the laws by which they are governed. Good purpose of, of chemistry, the object, uh, the ends of the branch, uh, we find applications for natural substances, uh, increasing the comforts and enjoyments of man. I think at this point in history, uh, we can maybe say that there's some downsides in, in finding too much comforts and enjoyments for man. <laughs> uh, but if, I, I mean, if, if I were to translate it, say maybe uh, for the benefit of man, that's that, that'd probably be better. But his day, I, I, I can't put myself over a start for David. Though. <laughs> <laughs> but and the demonstration of the order and harmony and, tele, and, and intelligent design of the system of the earth. So that's the ends of it. And then how it's done. Uh, he says there's, there's three parts, observation, experiment, and analogy. By observation, facts are distinctly and minutely impressed in the mind. Uh, analogy, similar facts are connected in experiments. New facts are discovered. Uh, and these things together cause progress. Uh, and if you continue on reading, uh, he gives an example of this. Uh, there's a certain plant that lives, uh, certain water plants, and if you look at, and it's when it's in the sunlight, you'll clearly see lots of little bubble signs. What do you think those little bubbles are? Only in the, only in the presence of the sunlight. Carbon dioxide. Oxygen. Oxygen. Yeah, yeah oxygen. So, so uh, my photosynthesis plants produce oxygen. Uh, and uh, his, so that's a good observation, right? An experiment. Take a wine, overturned wine glass, put it over there. Collect the bubbles. You can overturn it, take a lighted taper, piece of wood, put it in there, and what, what happens? Burns really bright, the presence of oxygen. So that's experiment. Analogy is connecting that to other. So this plant produces oxygen. What about other? What other? What about other aquatic plants? What about other plants? And, and that's analogy. You might need to do some more experiments to, to go on from there. Uh, another example of this. This is from uh, Sir Isaac Newton in his famous book, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Uh, he actually gives us rules for reasoning. There's four, but I would put three in here just to save that. All right. Uh, Rules of reasoning in, in philosophy, and the great thing about this, you can read his rules for it, and then you can see it, them in action as he reasons why universal gravity is a thing. 
Well, well he, when he makes the argument for universal gravity, he uses this rule for reasoning. So the first rule number one, we admit no more causes of natural things uh, than such as are both true and sufficient to explain their appearance. So let's say we're talking about uh, the Earth going in a circle around the sun. Uh, instead of looking for a hundred causes for this, maybe we just want one or two at most, right? Um, so we should look for uh, look for simplicity uh, and not not a superfluous number of causes. Uh, number two, uh, therefore, to the same natural effects, we must, as far as possible, assign the same causes. So. The, the moon goes around the Earth in a circle. The moons of Jupiter go around the Earth. Probably do the same thing, right? <clears throat> uh, so when you see similar things, we should probably assume uh, that, that they have the same causes. So respiration in a, in a man and beast is the same, is the same, really similar. Geology in Europe should be similar to that in America. The light of our culinary fi fire should be the same uh, as the light of the sun. They should both act in the same way. Uh, number three, the qualities of bodies which emit either intention or emission of degrees and which are found to belong to all bodies within the reach of our experiments are esteemed to be universal qualities of bodies whatsoever. So we can't do experiments on the entire universe. We can only observe so many things. Uh, so if if all the things on Earth and say in the solar system seem to operate by uh, universal gravi by gravitation, that the force of gravitation seems to be uh, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two objects, uh, uh, in everything that we can observe within our solar system and our planets, it's probably a universal quality, quant universal property that applies to everything. Uh, next slide. Scientists recognize they are studying a created world. Uh, we've seen this before. Copernicus said, uh, you know, the great artisan who designed the system of the world. Uh, we have uh, Sir Humphrey Davy, who's not really known for being particularly biased, but he said, looking for the intelligent design of the system of the Earth. Uh, and I got a couple more here. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton and his the mathematical, she's called the Principia, um, mathematical principles of natural philosophy, uh, has these observations. The most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And if the fixed stars are the centers of other like systems, these being formed by the, by the likewise counsel must all be subject to the dominion of one. And from his true dominion, it follows that the true God is living, intelligent, and powerful being, and from his other perfections, that he is supreme or most perfect. Uh, now, you know, when it comes to the theology of Isaac Newton, it's a little, uh, it's interesting. Because it's not like he's ignorant of it. He, he definitely knows his Bible, knows his biblical language. Um, he's kind of, uh, after, uh, credibly uh, accused of Arianism. It, it's, it, it's kind of, it, if you read his work, in, if you read the uh, the, uh, the the Principia, you will see hints at Arianism. And after his death, he had some stuff written in code that kind of kind of uh, seems to indicate that even more. Uh, but but he does make very logical arguments for the existence assistance of God. Don't, just don't trust him for the nature, especially the trying nature of God. Um, but let's go to somebody more orthodox and Lutheran. Uh, Johannes Kepler. Uh, so this is book is Harmonies of the World. This comes to like the second to last chapter, the one where uh, he describes his third law of planetary motion, which of course I think those three laws were kind of added later. <laughs> After Newton made three laws, they went back and had you know three laws of planetary motion. Uh, but uh, it, it's basically a prayer 
uh, for both him as the writer and for the hearer. I'll re read it to you. While I struggled to bring forth this process in the light of human intellect by the means of the elementary form customary with geometers, may the author of the heavens be favorable. The father of intellects, the bestower of mortal senses, uh, himself mortal and super blessed, and may he prevent the darkness of our mind from bringing forth in this work anything unworthy of his majesty. And may he effect that we, the imitators of God, by the help of the Holy Ghost, should rival the perfection of his works and sanctity of life, for which he chose his church throughout the earth, and by the blood of his Son cleanses it from sins, and that we should keep at a distance all the discords of enmity, all contentions, rivalries, angers, quarrels, dissensions, sex, envy, provocations, and irritations, rise to mocking speech, and other works of the flesh. And that along with myself, all who possess the spirit of Christ will not only desire, but will also strive by deeds to express and make sure their calling by spreading all crooked morals of all kinds, which have been veiled and painted over with the cloak of seal or the love of truth or a singular erudition or modesty over against contentious teachers or with any other showy garments. Holy Father, keep us safe in the concord of our love for one another, that we may be one, just as thou art one, with a Son, our Lord, and with the Holy Ghost, just as through the sweetest bonds of harmonies thou hast made all the, thy works one, and that from the bringing of thy people uh, into concord, the body of the ch thy church may be built up in the earth, as thou didst direct the heavens themselves out of harmonies. All right. So I gave you both plenty of examples here, and I. Uh, there's lots of interesting things. There are some challenges. Uh, they're often in ancient and foreign languages, uh, such as Greek, Latin, and even some like German, French, uh, other languages. And that's actually kind of good. Scientists today actually it's very useful for them to know some foreign languages because it does happen internationally. But the nice thing is there's a lot of English translations available. Uh, they don't necessarily need to go from the original language for reading science papers, as nice as that would be. <laughs> um, and a lot of them are in public domain, so you can find free copies online or buy really cheap ones, uh, which is you know, great, great, very useful. Uh, archaic language, this is one thing that I would hope that our classical students would uh, build the skill of learning English that's a little older. <laughs> A couple hundred years old. It shouldn't be too big a problem. We should get used to it. <laughs> uh, changing scientific no nomenclature. Uh, as science progresses, we actually have to build new vocabulary terms and sometimes repurpose old ones. Uh, just like the word star used to mean like all the things in the heavens, the sun, moon, uh, all the planets. They were all different types of stars. Now we say they're the gas balls, the glow one. Uh, that thing changes over time. Chemistry notation changes a lot. Uh, anybody know what azote is? <laughs> no. It's, uh, it means no life for nitrogen. It's part of the air that doesn't support life, unlike oxygen. Uh, and you'll, sit, you'll just see terms like that. Most of them you can just look up. Uh, but it can't be a challenge. Uh, repetitive, precise writing. Uh, it seems like... Uh, a lot of scientists really love Euclid and like to write like him. Uh, just, you know, really long paragraphs, something that might be able to be in an equation, but it, it, it's, it's very something you have to get used to. <laughs> All right, superseded theories. Uh, you'll, you'll read about caloric, uh, heat as a substance. Things like that, um, and you know, just have to keep in mind. Sometimes, as we saw with Copernicus, those guys, ideas can come back. And sometimes they can just be useful to us. Uh, the, nowadays, everybody knows that everything goes around the sun, but prob probably couldn't describe how the night sky looks. Like, where would I find the planets? How do they move through us? If you actually go back to the Ptolemaic theory, uh, theory, you can actually say, oh, it's like the stars in a big sphere around the Earth, going around it, and the planets are going along the line called the 
ecliptic, and sometimes they're, they're generally going in one direction by going backward sometimes. You know? So going back to previous series can actually help us understand things sometimes. Uh, and then another problem, sometimes there's a lot of geometry in other math, and sometimes you might reach your limit. That's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I got a, just a couple of works that I couldn't work in here, but are just recommend recommendations. Side real messenger. Uh, this is where Galileo discovered discovers four moons of Jupiter. It's really fun because it's kind of like day by day log. He he sees this and gets pretty excited and trying to figure out what's going on. He gets thwarted by a cloudy night that makes him have to wait another day to figure out what's going on with Jupiter. Uh, two new science is uh, this is another book by Galileo. Uh, if, if you're interested in the laws of motion and Newton's too uh, Newton's too hard, go, go to Galileo because he describes things very well with experiments. And he has this really interesting dialogue between four different people. It's an interesting way of doing science writing. <laughs> uh, uh, Chemical History of the Can Candle by Michael Faraday. Uh, this is a series of lectures relating a lot of chemistry just to how a candle works. And what's really cool about it is some people have made some uh, adaptations of this where they re uh, read this and do the experiments. You can find. I recommend uh, a series of videos on the chemical history of the candle by engineering guy on YouTube <laughs> because uh, it, it shows it, he re used the original words and then he uh, 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 and then he does the experiments or at least an adaptation of the experiments. And that's all I have. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> Uh, about using the um, I, well, generally we read them together because you know when you when it comes to all literature, there's a certain level that they can read, and if it's above their level, if you read it together or read it to them, uh, you can help explain those things to them. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I'll have them answer. I'll have a question that I expect them to pull up and answer that a question that. I had. I, Expect them to be in this study, and sometimes I want them just to appreciate it. Um, and then, what, uh, what mix of this with other things do you find? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the right mix. Sometimes I think maybe it'd be great to have, just have a year of it in, in high school <laughs> where, where we just focus on this uh, entirely and have the chance to go through the entire course. But uh, in in middle school, I, I tend to go like, well, uh, we're studying this. We read a chapter from our textbook on this, and then let's 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 read a section from from the author. Yes, it is very compelling the sort of story of science that you're telling, the argument of science, the conversation of science. Are there any good curriculums or resources that you would recommend for doing this with our kids that put together the type of things that you put together? Oh, okay. Um, well, any book that actually quotes the, the works that they, uh, or at least mentions the names of the books is very helpful. Um, I, don't, I haven't done a lot of it. I, for, for junior high, I've been using some of like John Hudson Tyner's books because yeah, it tells the story a little bit at least, and then I'm able to go from there. Uh, I'm still learning how to work it up it. So much to cover anyway, but I, I do want to include it more. So, We've been looking for years for like a homeschool curriculum that yes. does form the story of science and fill out um, all of that. Jonathan Tyner is pretty good for like middle school level on that. Okay. Uh, he's really good for the history side. Um, yeah, Novari high, high school ones are, are pretty good for history too. Have you looked into Euclid's elements much, or is that Just a whole different subject? I, 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 everybody, everybody talks, talks about, about it so much that, that I want to read it. And I'm teaching geometry this year, so I think I probably will. I at least cracked open the front, and I think at a certain point I went through it enough, and was like, if I really want to do this, I have to get out a pen and paper and crawl up it. So I, I, I skipped it, and I know it's like I know I want to actually get down to the paper and go through the proper. All right. Another stick.